Welcome to Habitat Live. Our guest today is Alan Wolf, shareholder at the law firm of Anderson Kill. So let's get right to it. I'm on my co-op or condo board, and I'm beginning to hear that some of our residents are getting laid off. Looking ahead, we anticipate a cash crunch. Do we have any kind of insurance which is going to help us out? Uh, good morning, Carol, uh, and hello to everybody. Thank you, and I hope everyone is doing safe and well under these circumstances. It's certainly a challenging time. Let's turn to your question, Carol. The answer is maybe. <laughs> and the reason I say maybe is that it's going to depend on what coverage you have, what the policies provide. But typically, we would look to a property insurance policy for this because we would like to see if we can characterize these losses as business income losses that may be covered by your property insurance. Okay, before we sort of get into that, tell me what kind of insurance do most co-op and condo buildings have? What are the what are the names of the policies? Right. So they would typically have a first party property policy they call it. First party simply means that if you suffer a loss, the insurance company is going to pay directly to you as opposed to what we call third party coverage, which is if you had some action where someone sued you, the insurance company would have to protect you and pay them on your behalf. That's third party coverage. So okay, that's what so we call have, general liability coverage. So I have property, I have general liability. We all know we I have directors and, you would, and, directors and officers. That's right. And you may also have work comp for any employees, supers, okay. others who may be on your payroll. So now what what is business interruption insurance and which policy might it be under? Certainly. So business interruption are also called business income insurance. It's it's titled the same uh, different things, but it covers usually the same losses in policies is usually nested within a first party property policy that the policy that actually protects the physical uh, property that you own. Um, and sometimes it is a standalone policy, but more often than not, it is seen as a coverage within your property policy. Sometimes it's called a commercial property policy. Sometimes it's just called a property policy. Uh, but you would want to look within there for your business income or business interruption coverage. So I understand if we have a fire and it's sort of clear yeah. that this pays for an interim uh, time. This is not a fire. This is a virus or a bacteria. Is business right. interruption insurance going to help me out? Again, maybe. Uh, the reason I say maybe is that we have already seen positions taken and statements written by various insurance companies in response to the ongoing crisis related to coronavirus, COVID-19, um, uh, essentially prematurely, if you will, disclaiming the likelihood of any coverage, saying that these policies uh, business income as part of a property insurance policy require uh, physical damage, property damage to be suffered at the premise before the business would be covered. So let's give an illustration that people would be more familiar with. If you had a property that had a fire and then you had to shut down the property for the period during which you needed to repair the premises and restore them to operation, then your property coverage would cover the physical damage to the property and the business interruption coverage or business income coverage would cover your lost income during that period when you were dark, when you were unable to operate because you had to close and repair. Um, and then that way you re emerge from this repair largely intact. You've, you've had your premises repaired and you've had your income losses covered. Um, the positions taken by the insurance industry right now are indicating that they do not regard the ongoing crisis as involving physical damage. And my response to that, and this won't be a surprise, my firm, Anderson Kill, specializes in representing policyholders uh, in their claims and in their interests, present insurance companies um, on claims. The, uh, the policyholder uh, is going to take the position that there is physical damage. The insurance company is going to take the position that there is no physical damage. It is an unknown right now. Um, so what... We can so think of... Let me just... Let me just jump in. Yeah. I get the insurance companies doesn't want to, for what, for their own reasons, don't want to pay for this. But as a board, do we file a claim? Do we not file a claim? Is there a time right. limit? Why should we? And how, how is it done? 
Okay. So first and foremost, the answer is yes. You want to give notice because you will see, and I encourage anyone they would that would like to to go ahead and look at their policy. You will see language in most insurance policies, and including these property policies that have the business interruption or business in coverage. They will say you have to give us prompt notice or you have to give us notice within a certain amount of time of the loss you're suffering. So you don't want to delay giving notice. That's important to do. Now, having given the notice, um, you're going to in all likelihood suffer or not suffer, but get a response from the insurance company disclaiming coverage. But at least then you are, if you will, in the game. You've given notice to the insurance company. And what we've seen over many years, unrelated to the current crisis, what we've seen over many years is that in situations where notice was given, albeit imperfectly, that put the policyholder in a more protected position for the coverage than if notice had not been given at all. If notice had not been given at all, then the insurance company may be in a better position to disclaim coverage and to um, state that they don't have any obligation to cover whatsoever because you failed to comply with the notice requirement of the policy. And what is a typical time limit for this notice? Uh, when practicable, uh, promptly, there are a variety of phrases that are used in policies, and so there is no ironclad answer. But what we like to do and we encourage uh, people to do is to consider a 30-day window as much as possible. Um, after you've suffered the immediacy of a loss, no one expects you to say, oh, my first reaction is going to be to cover, um, to, to give notice to my insurance because um, time is ticking and that has to know your first priority needs to be the safety and security of people and property, right? Um, and once you've, you've sort of gotten through the immediacy of that crisis, then you can step back and start analyzing your business circumstances and make sure you give notice as appropriate. So this is sort of the beginning of the crisis and there, you know, I maybe have not suffered the loss today, but in a month when I have a cash shortage, I will have suffered a loss or may have difficulty paying our bills. W what, is there a clock that starts ticking? A clock, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I, do, I it, can tell you that, okay. Is there a clock that starts ticking in terms of a time limit to give notice? I mean, if I give notice um, in 60 again, days, what is? Okay, so in, the short answer is no, there's not usually an ironclad time frame by which there's a clear benchmark. Um, under New York law, uh, in some instances when late notice is given, if the insurance company is unable to show that they were prejudiced by the lateness of the notice, then they may have a basis to claim that prior notice would have saved them all this trouble, they were entitled to prior notice, they didn't get that prior notice, therefore they don't have to cover it or they don't have to cover that portion of it. That's not going to be the case here. Um, I think anyone who's giving notice in a 30 or a 60 day time frame is probably still going to be okay in terms of notice. Now, a notice issue is a completely separate thing from whether you actually will get the coverage. And you can expect that most insurance companies will probably respond with a disclaimer of coverage. So this is kind of a, maybe a stupid question. Do I, who gives the notice? Do I call our insurance broker? Do I call our managing agent? Do I call our attorney? Who, who does it? We don't do it, do we? Um, no, what we typically recommend is that brokers be noticed on behalf of their policyholders. So the broker that sold you your insurance package, call them up and say, uh, and in fact, Rebney put a publication out just the other day that said they're advising everyone to put, put, uh, put their insurance on notice and to notify their brokers as such. So that's how we would advise proceeding as well. Um, Remember that notice be, may become a debated issue, and so you want to make sure that you have a paper trail reflecting when you endeavored to give notice. I will tell you that um, someone shared with me the other day, and I was frankly a little surprised to see it, uh, a broker had a Q&A, a sort of frequently asked questions sheet prepared. And in response to a policyholder contacting the broker saying, I think I might have a loss here, would you please... Uh, let me know what my options are and give notice on my behalf, not being as direct perhaps as we might like them. The response from the broker was to send them this five question and answer uh, sheet that basically said, um, here's why we don't think you'll have coverage. And oh. I completely disagree with that approach uh, and, and because that approach also involved. And so therefore, we don't think 
you should have to give or you should give notice to your insurance company. I completely disagree with that approach. I do not advise um, anyone who would be my client. I would not advise them to not give notice at this point. So I just, this is just a sort of a practical question. Is it a lot of work for on the broker's behalf to give notice? I mean, do they, do they, not is it all. a lot of paperwork? Oh, it's not. It is not at all. It is basically a one page or one paragraph statement that they can send to each insurance company. It can essentially be the same statement uh, with three or four different insurance companies listed for the different coverages because they're giving notice to any and all applicable or potentially responsive coverage. Okay, one more, one more question. Let's say that my building has commercial tenants and let's say, you know, it's not the, and let's say the governor through his order has shut, has, has shut those stores down. So now I, I don't, if, if not today, in a month, I don't have their rental income. Is, th is that a stronger case for business interruption insurance? Um, it will increase your potential recovery, and uh, you may very well have enough just there to say, look, I suffered property damage um, by the presence of the coronavirus or by the decrees and, and orders of the government barring the assembly of persons or the trafficking of persons to my property, um, <clears throat> or there was an ingress egress restriction that made it impossible for persons to reach my property where this commercial tenant is located. Um, therefore, I'm suffering property damage at my property. That tenant is um, one of my sources of income. And in many policies where you would have a commercial tenant, they may be listed as what we call CBI, Contingent Business Interruption Coverage, which says that if this tenant on whom I am greatly dependent for revenue has a problem, that's part of my supply chain. And when that falls out of my supply chain, I'm suffering damage to my property as a result, and therefore I am covered for that. So you can examine your policy. You may very well find that a, an impact to a commercial tenant, let's say it's a restaurant on the ground floor of your property, um, a financial impact to that tenant that arises out of this property damage instance may trigger and add to the recovery you entitled to from your insurance company. And I have one other question. Most buildings, certainly that are staffed, the staff is doing extra cleanings um, to protect residents. But there are a lot of buildings where there, there is not a lot of staff or there is no staff doing cleanings. As a board, am I, what, do I, what do we have to do to protect ourselves so that some shareholder who perhaps gets COVID the COVID disease isn't going to say we were negligent or irresponsible in protecting their health and welfare. Right. Um, that is an evolving scenario. Um, and it's, it's very difficult, I think, to give an ironclad answer here. I think you should do everything that's reasonable, necessary, appropriate, and prudent to maintain your property in as clean and safe a way as you could, even under these circumstances. Um, and, and it's just very difficult to, to say uh, what impact that might have. Um, clearly, if you do nothing, you're exposing yourself to greater risk of liability for failure to maintain your property as you should. So if, if, I, if I'm in a, for instance, a self-managed building where I don't have a staff cleaning and do nothing, I mean, I don't have somebody there to do the cleaning. If I, as a board, send out a letter to all the shareholders alerting them to what they could do, for instance. Is, is that um, enough of a step for a board to take? I don't know that it's enough. Again, the circumstances are going to be very fact specific for the scenario and the type of property you operate, but it could be very much um, enough or close to enough uh, within your circumstances. Again, it's very hard for me to give a a black and white answer to that because uh, the facts will, will determine it. But the, the short answer really is you should continue to maintain your property and keep it clean and service it reasonably under the circumstances. That's the standard. You, you do not need to turn it into a, a surgical operating room. Uh, and similarly, you shouldn't let it um, disintegrate into a total mess. But um, how far you can go with your cleaning and how per pervasive the presence of this virus may be, that's very difficult for any of us to assess right now. So bottom line, 
a prudent board who anticipates or some kind of cash shortage should be filing uh, a claim or ask, asking their broker to file a claim under the business interruption portion? Uh, they should they should give notice to their insurance through their broker to any and all applicable or responsive insurance, potentially responsive insurance, that they are suffering losses at their property, which may be covered under the policies. And so um, I wouldn't choke it in and, and limit it to just business interruption coverage because you may have physical property damage at your property. And just as a, and, and you should also be giving notice to general liability coverage, to DNO coverage, just so that everyone is on notice. But let me turn to the physical damage on the property. That's going to be a very hotly fought issue. We know that the insurance companies are already and probably can be expected to continue to take the position that the presence of the virus does not constitute property damage that would trigger coverage. Well, to me, that's still a big question mark. I think you'd be very hard pressed. Uh, to get a scientist or a medical practitioner to tell you that coronavirus did not cause physical damage or that coronavirus was not a physical being, a physical entity. You, you may not be able to see it with the naked eye, but as soon as you look through a microscope, you can indeed see it, and it is physical. So the question of the presence of the coronavirus is going to physical damage to the property is a very open question right now, which is why I'm so strongly advising um, policyholders that they should not hesitate to give notice to their insurance companies of this because it may in fact work out to be indeed a covered claim. The failure to give notice may constitute an, a failure to qualify for coverage for failure to give notice, which is one of the requirements in most all of those policies. Okay, I'll just continue on one thing that I know is top of mind for everyone. What if I give notice? I'm never going to get the coverage. The insurance company is going to deny the coverage. And then all they're going to do is next year when it comes time for renewal, they're going to raise my premiums or they're going to drop me from insurance or they're going to put on some horrible exclusion that's going to prevent me from ever getting coverage for anything like this ever again in the future. Okay. All very valid concerns. Here's a simple response. Those things are going to happen anyway, whether you gave the notice or not, because the insurance companies and the insurance industry is facing such an impact from this um, pandemic that they are not going to be able to continue to write insurance on the same basis that they did before. And they will end up putting on these kinds of exclusions or limitations. They are going to be raising premiums. They may be dropping policyholders here or there. But those things are going to happen and would happen whether you gave notice or not. That's just the new world we're living in right now. Okay, thank you very much. Stay safe and healthy. I agree, everyone, please stay safe and healthy. We're with you, we're looking out for you. If there's anything that any of us uh, at my law firm can do to assist, we're happy to do so, thank you. Thank you.